Let's go. Let's start. Okay. Tov. We'll learn some Torah. It is Hanukkah. And we are in um, coming to you live from the land of Israel, from the, the land of miracles. You know, here the Sivivon has Nes Gadol Hayapo. Instead of Nes Gadol Hayasham, that means a great miracle. The four letters on the four sides of the, the, the dreidel, the Sivivon, as we call it in Hebrew, has the four letters of Nes Gadol, a great miracle, Hayapo versus Nes Gadol Hayasham, which I grew up with in Canada. Um, so as I said, we're here in the land of miracles. So um, let's try to uh, let's try to spread the light. And uh, I want to talk about uh, joy and happiness. I don't know if you're aware, but Israel just signed the peace accord. Um, and the peace accord, believe it or not, was with a small, uh, a small nation that's called Bhutan. Anybody here of what I'm, know what I'm talking about? Anyways, Bhutan is in between Nepal and, uh, you know, India, and it's a small town, a uh, small country, uh, but it has a vote in the UN. So we're happy to, but more more significantly for our purposes, Bhutan is the founder of the Gross National Happiness Index. Index, and they say instead of the every you know every nation gets measured on their GDP, the gross domestic product, and how successful they are, and it says, well, that's really uh, very dollars and cents and uh, materialistic uh, way of looking at it. But ultimately what we want out of life is happiness. And so they came up with this uh, index based on a lot of different factors. They surveyed all the people in many different countries called the Gross National Happiness Index. So maybe we can learn something from our new relationships with, uh, with Bhutan. But in any case, either way, um, Happiness is a big issue in the world today. You know, in Yale, the most popular class ever, believe it or not, was given is given by an Israeli. Um, it's called How to Live a Happy Life. And it's such a big problem because uh, people are, you know, even though we may have, have more uh, wealth, more prosperity than ever before, we um, were less and less happy. And uh, they want to make a guess how many self-help books there are, have been published on happiness. I Googled it just before. And um, believe it or not, 23,000 books about happiness have been published. And, you know, I think that just proves that none of them work because if, if one worked, then the other 22,999 wouldn't have been written. But apparently we're all struggling trying to figure out a way to be happy. And why do we want to talk about this on Hanukkah? Hanukkah is a time of joy. How do I know it's a time of joy? In the Jewish calendar, really the time of joy is Sukkot. Sukkot uh, is the time where it says, uh, you know, Zman Simchatenu and Samachta Bechakecha. Well, Hanukkah in many ways is parallel to the parallel rabbinic holiday to the eight days of Sukkot, the eight days of Hanukkah. And in many ways, it's an extension of Sukkot because Sukkot is the uh, holiday, it's called Chagah Asif, where we collect all of our uh, harvest of all of our fruit trees that are uh, blossoming, um, uh, that, that have grown over the summer. And in the fall, the, our stores are brimming with summer fruit and we're just so happy. And uh, Actually, there's one last fruit which doesn't ripen in the summer. And believe it or not, it comes ripe right around the month of Kislev, or the equivalent month in English it would be December. And that, uh, lo and behold, is the olive tree and the olive produce, uh, of course, which makes the olive oil for us to get our miracle with the olive oil on Hanukkah. So there is in many ways, uh, it's also even mentioned in the book of the Maccabees, 
that the, that the Maccabees didn't manage to celebrate Sukkot that year, so they celebrated it on Hanukkah in Kislev. What are you doing celebrating Sukkot in Kislev? Well, actually, as I said, it's an extension. But what's the difference? If they're so connected and then we eight days and eight days and, and Sukkot, uh, why have another holiday of Sukkot? Well, the way I see it is that um, on Sukkot, it's natural time to be joyous. As I said, uh, also on Pesach, it's the springtime, everything's blooming. And But even in the fall, when you have your, your, your fruit that you've gathered in, during the winter, a few months later, already it's starting to get cold. I don't know what it's like in Cincinnati now. Um, and it's dark. The day, day hours, daylight hours have, have diminished. And uh, you can't really grow much, at least in Israel, during the, the summer months, the winter months. And so it's a real challenge to be happy uh, during the winter. And uh, perhaps that's what Hanukkah, the lights of Hanukkah, are trying to, to give us a boost, or trying to tell us, be happy, joy, even though you're in dark times. And of course, I'm not just talking about the physical darkness and the physical uh, you know, uh, temperature of it being cold, but I think it's a symbol for all of us. And that uh, there's times in life where it's very difficult to be happy, and there's so many challenges and so many difficulties that each and every one of us goes through, whether it's, uh, you know, medical issues or, or uh, livelihood issues or, or family issues or there's just so many things that we, apparently, people want to take the most popular class ever is how to live a happy life. It's very hard to be happy. It's just a serious business. People would, you know, they're making a lot of money selling these 23,000 books, which obviously don't work, but they're still making money doing them because people are looking at how to be happy. So it's obviously a challenge. And I think the, the, the first thing to recognize it, that it is, it's work. It's work to try to, um, to try to achieve happiness. Of course, it, in, uh, Torah, happiness is not necessarily a mitzvah. It's not one of the 613, except maybe on the festivals of Sukkot, we just mentioned before, Samach Tabachagecha. But the rest of the year, some people say it's not actually um, uh, one of the 613 obligations, but it is a it is a good midah. It's definitely a very important trait, character trait. And uh, you might be familiar with the song, Mitzvah Gedola, Liot Basim Chatamid popularized by Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. And it's called a mitzvah gadol, even though it's not really a mitzvah, it's just a midah. Uh, well, in many ways, most of the midot are preparations for the mitzvot. They're fundamentals upon which, uh, if we cultivate this way of, of uh, behavior, then we're able to do all the mitzvot. So you could call it a super mitzvah. Or, or the foundation for all mitzvot to have this joy. And uh, why is it so central? Why is it so such an important fundamental of our avodat Hashem? And it's called a mitzvah because it's, it's Ratzon Hashem. God wants us to. So even though it's not a, technically one of the 613 mitzvot, it's, it is uh, referred to as a great uh, obligation because uh, God wants you to be happy. It's a fundamental to our avodat Hashem. And uh, I'm not going to go into the sources right now, but... Uh, you know, I saw a few explanations, and I think uh, I like um, I like the image of a machinery who has all these, uh, like a motor of a car or or any kind of uh, other machine which has different wheels and and uh, belts and uh, um, different moving parts. So you need some oil to make sure that the machine will work. So that oil, in many ways. Um, you could see the joy is like that. that without the joy, you don't really, it, it, it may, you know, eke out, it may do the job, but it won't do it uh, successfully, right? The, the, the soldiers on their way to winning the battle, they're singing, it gives them strength. The joy really um, helps you, helps you uh, be successful at whatever you do. So the joy, uh, one of the Rebbe's of Chabad said that um, when you're, when you're, happy you you break out of yourself you break out of your regular patterns and routines and you're able to to uh do things you wouldn't otherwise uh uh do and you you let loose of some of the things that are holding you back so 
you want to break boundaries. You want to break into something that's new. So the joy is so key to have that that uh, that, that feeling. And uh, ultimately, if we're joyous, then God can treat us with joy. And so there's a lot of it's a really important midah. It's a really important uh, besides the fact that we all want to be happy for ourselves because it's no fun to be sad. So we don't. But it's really a key to our our, our worship of Hashem and our vodah of Hashem. So how do we do that? How do we achieve happiness? And of course, so here we are on a holiday. So light the candles, nice start. But you can light the candles and be miserable. And so how do you actually uh, get more serious? And I think I found at least a few keys that uh, maybe uh, would bring us a little bit towards the, uh, the 23,001 book, or maybe one book that will actually I can prove to you why all the other words don't work. So with your permission, we'll go a little forward and we'll, um, we'll talk about how we can achieve joy in our lives. And the first assumption, of course, is, as I said, that we need to work at it. It's something that we can actually to fight, that we have to fight. Maybe it's a natural, you know, babies are happy. Of Cook says that's the natural state of a healthy person to be happy, but we lose it. There's, you know, we all know that uh, there's difficulties in life, and, and it's hard to keep it uh, that that naivete and that simple uh, joy that babies have uh, when they're just happy at every new discovery. And uh, how do we work? How do we fight that? How do we uh, fight to to not lose that and to find that joy even in very difficult and dark times? So Rav Kook, in his book, uh, his commentary on the Talmud, in Einaya, he uh, suggests that there are two major methods. And um, before I start with Rav Kook, I want to remind us all, of course, that we pray for our happiness. Praying is uh, definitely a good method. All right, Samcheinu, uh, it's in the Brachot of Haftar, and many times we say, Aleinu uh, Tochav Samcheinu Vinyana, we pray to God that he should make us joyous. And so uh, praying to God for joy is definitely should be part of your, your, your routine and your ritual. And um, if it's something important to you, then you should definitely pray for it. So um, without further ado, Ruff Cook, he says, the first simple way to, to be happy, of course, is to pay attention to the good stuff. Turn away from the difficulty. Focus on what's good. It's sort of almost like a mental escape from the difficulties you you know look at the glass that's half full instead of glass that's half empty the story is told by Rav Zusha, one of the hasidic masters who um who had a very difficult life he had no real means of of uh, livelihood and he lived in a broken down house you know the kid they didn't have enough clothing and they were really full of uh medical issues and uh the story goes that Reb Shmelka Nicholsberg and his brother Rabbi Pinchas, um, they went to the Magid, the Magid of um, of Mezrich, the student of um, some people would call him the father of Chasidut, the student of the Baal Shem Tov, and they asked him, "How can we fulfill the Mishnah and Brachot, which says that every person has to bless Hashem for not only the the good?" They have to bless him for the bad. How can you bless? I understand what it means when you're happy, when you're good. Things are going well. I bless Hashem. Thank him. But how can you bless for the bad things that happen? And they wanted some guidance from the Rebbe, from the Magid of Mezrich. And he told them, I'm not going to answer you. I want you to go get the answer from Reb Zusha. So they went and they went to his town, the small town. Everybody, they asked, where does Reb Zusha live? Where does Reb Zusha live? And they, they're brought to his house. And as I said, it's a, some kind of a ramshackle hut with very little um, amenities. And, uh, you know, he's in tatters. The kids don't have proper clothing. And maybe they're even crying because they're hungry. And they go up to Rabbi Zusha and they uh, say, Shalom Aleichem. And he says, Shalom Aleichem, what, what, you know, what are you doing here? Thank you for visiting, but what's the point? And he said, well, we asked the Magid our question about how we can you know, thank Hashem and bless Hashem, even when things are bad. And the Magid sent us to you to ask you. And Reb Zusha says to them, well, there must be some mistake here because uh, I don't know why he sent you to me. 
I don't have any problem. I don't have any afflictions. <laughs> Everything's great. And uh, so this is, I think, the first approach from Cook mentions is that really it's a question of focus. You can focus on the good. And uh, there's so many uh, ways to do that. You know, whenever we talk about the tools, how to guide ourselves. Nowadays, we have something called CBT, right? Cognitive and behavioral therapies. So we think we, we, we think about our thoughts and our behaviors. So of course, our, our thoughts, Rabbi Nachman and Reish Pei Bet, the, uh, in the second volume of uh, Likuti Maharan, he has a famous Torah that talks about Nekudot Tovot. If you just find something about yourself, about your life, which is good, focus on that, that one thing. I know everything, everything's terrible, everything's terrible, everything's terrible, except for one thing. Just find one good thing and um, focus on that. So, you know, there's a whole school of psychology called positive thinking, which is, I think, a lot, big part of what that course in Yale uh, teaches about how to be happy. And positive, positive thinking is uh, it's a, powerful te- a powerful technique and a lot of people practice it in, in ways which are very effective. And um, that's, of course, in terms of thoughts, but also in terms of activities, right? The, the, the behavioral side, you want to be happy. So do happy things, do fun things, you know, watch funny shows, listen to music that you like. Even the prophets, they wanted to, they needed joy to receive their prophecy. So they listened to music. Nowadays, we all have the machines and the devices. We can learn, listen to music at a high level of, uh, you know, uh, quality, 24-7, in our ears without disturbing anybody else. Unbelievable. We have so, such opportunities. So by all means, enjoy. Listen to music. Anything. It's so important that do whatever you need to do. Eat ice cream if that's what makes you happy. Pamper yourself. You know, there's a bracha on being happy. What's the bracha on being happy? Due to physical things, when you get something physical which you enjoy, there's a bracha. And of course, I'm referring to the shechianu. You buy a new uh, shirt, you're happy about it. You make a bracha shechianu because it gives you joy. And you buy a new suit, you buy you buy uh, some new uh, uh, a new computer, a new phone. You're so happy. You should say shechianu. So use the more simple things that are easy to access and to change to be happy and don't discount that. Just say, oh, that's just, you know, uh, silly, but it's actually so important. Based, so we said the, the, the cognitive, the thoughts, the, thoughts, the behavioral, the, the activities that, that make you happy. These are tools to be happy, to focus on the good and not on the bad. That's definitely one method of happiness. And uh, I don't think we should discount all of the, the above activities. As I said, there's even a bracha on being happy. However, I think uh, like in most Torahs, we're waiting for the second method because, you know, uh, like the new clothes, they wear out pretty fast. And the joy on uh, eating ice cream is short-lived. And for the most part, these uh, material uh, comforts, whatever they may be, are ephemeral, they're short-lived, and uh, the very, before you know it, you'll be needing a new fix. And um, they don't really solve the problem. That's, uh, that's A, the, the problem, the first problem with that approach to achieving joy and happiness. The second problem is, um, okay, so you say, don't worry, be happy. It's easy to say. And often the, the problems are real. The problems are too real to be ignored and they encroach and they keep bothering you. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, there's really bad stuff, horrible stuff that you, you, it's too hard to turn your, your attention away from it. You know, there's always traffic and there's an accident on the highway. It's called rubbernecking, right? Because people are just naturally, you're drawn to look at the difficult things. And um, frankly, that can really get depressing. We, we naturally focus on, if something hurts, you focus on the pain, on your suffering, the illness, the, your life situation. Here we are in a pandemic, in Corona. So it, it's not easy, you know, it's quite depressing. And uh, just to say, even though we, we said there's different tools to get you there, 
Perhaps there's a deeper way. Well, I don't know if you hear that, but uh, I'm going to make a bracha. Just before there was also lightning, you can say another bracha. We're having a lovely uh, thunderstorm here in Israel. It's the time of rain, so we're very excited when rain comes. So uh, another thing to be happy about. So uh, I see the blessing on, on all the, the bounty which Hashem gives us. But moving on, I think really Rav Kook does give a, a deeper approach to how to achieve joy. And they really, you know, they, I've been interchanging between the word happiness and joy. Um, you could say, I'm not sure how it works exactly in English, but the, usually when you say you're in a happy, it's, it's more like a mood. It's a, it's a mood that swings. Joy is more of a, an internal quality, an attitude that we want to cultivate. It's a, it's a real way of, of being, to just be uh, always joyful. And it's maybe a different reaction to anything that happens. And so how do we get there? How do we get to that, um, that more internal joy, which you want to cultivate and continually uh, access? So if Cook says uh, the second method, is not so much about you know focusing on the good things, um, but it's actually it may be you know as we said in the first uh, the first direction was even ignoring or trying to play down or not vote not not, not uh, you know turn your attention away from the difficulties. In the second method, Rav Cook describes that um, actually you can stare the difficulty, the bad parts the sad parts of life, stare it in the face and still have joy because those bad parts, those difficulties, those dips, those dips are part of a sine, cosine curve, which is like waves in the sea. And if you want to have a sea, you're going to have waves, you're going to have up and down. And ultimately what Rav Cook is challenging us to do is to have, gain a, a bigger perspective and recognize uh, I like to call it emotional maturity, that we can't always just um, expect only good things and only uh, uh, happiness, but to, to recognize that uh, living in this world, yeah, this world, some for some reason, God created the world, and he created an ocean uh, that does go up and down, and our job is to, uh, you know, uh, ride the wave. To, to be able to navigate and not expect that everything is just going to be calm, smooth sailing. Um, but recognize that our current situation, however difficult it is, is part of a larger drama. You're part of a larger story. The Zohar says that if you really understand uh, yourself, there's two sides of the heart. And the Tanya explains in chapter 34 that there's two sides of the heart because you have two souls. And but the but what does that mean that you can have sadness in one part of you and you don't have to ignore it, it can be part of your awareness, but you also have the other side, you also have a greater awareness, um, which uh, includes the joy, and you know that that joy is coming, and you have the moon, you have faith that Hashem gives us this pain now, but He has a greater plan of goodness which is coming, and basically, you, you try to include right rabbi nachman has a great story he says when sometimes you're dancing in a circle and everybody's excited and there's one guy out there on the uh, on the periphery who does not dancing because he's just too sad and so what's the job our job is to, to grab him in we got bring him in bring him in and make him help him join the the, the dance and um, maybe the dance is not just a circle but it's a dance uh, uh, the dance of life with dips and peaks and uh, you sort of grab those sad parts and help them be part of this longer dance, a more complicated dance of life. And um, this perspective, gaining this perspective is, is a key to this deeper kind of, of joy that even though you may not always be, you know, uh, um, don't worry, be happy. And uh, you're not always feeling great, but ultimately, you have this inner sense of calm and joy, which because you recognize that you're part of this God's world and God put you in this uh, world and you're connected to a greater, bigger, bigger picture. And uh, that can give you joy. Being 
aware and being conscious that you're part of something bigger, that uh, ultimately uh, you can see the big ocean and uh, ride the wave of the dips, but then you also have the high waves. And if you know how to surf, you'll be enjoying that. Um, but I want to, with your permission, I want to go one step further um, and add something a little bit more personal because gaining perspective, awareness, it's, it's, um, it tells us how to view the world. But I, what I want to, what I was looking for when I was preparing this year is more a question of how do I view myself? How do I change my, my attitude? It's not just about seeing the big picture out there and you know believing something about that god gives us this great ocean uh but it's something i think the key is um uh a little bit more personal and that is uh, i want to teach a torah from uh the uh previous Babach Rebbe, known as the the rayat and he he stressed that the perspective that's going to give you really access to, to joy. And this is so, so true, I believe. And I found this for myself as well, is that, you know, sometimes people are upset because they're perfectionists. What you have to do is not change the way you view the world, the greater perspective of, on life. What's your role? What do I do in this life that Hashem gave me? And, um, basically what he's suggesting is that we have to cultivate a very, very different attitude to, uh, to ourselves. You know, the morale says joy comes from completeness, from perfection. Gonna, with your permission, I'm going to make one more bracha. And... Um, Completeness, perfection, it's impossible. We're not perfect, both materially, spiritually. You know, I always like to say that they have these, these great uh, contests, whether it's um, the Olympics or it's uh, Miss Universe, whatever it is. There's only one winner who gets the gold. So that one winner is happy, but all the others, are they all doomed to sadness? That only one person can be the best. Is everybody else supposed to be sad? If all you're looking for is to be the best, you're going to be disappointed. And um, I believe that it's further than that. It's, it's a very deep truth that if you get $100, you want $200, right? The, being a millionaire doesn't always make you happy. Most millionaires don't know how to deal with it. And they're just looking over their shoulders saying, oh, hmm, he's got $2 million and he's got a billion. And when, when do I enter the, the billionaires club? And how do I, and they're worried about how am I going to lose it. But beyond that, if you're going to look for making your life perfect, making yourself a complete success, you're setting yourself up for failure. Everybody wants to be happy. And they want to, they want to be somebody important in context. We want to all want to be a tzaddik. You want to be a Talmud Chacham. You want to be uh, perfect, the guy who you you can think of in your high school who always knew all the answers or who was always popular or you always want to be the the guy who's he's got it or the girl who's got it. And um, that perfectionism is really setting yourself for failure. So what's the alternative? Because we want to be successful. So if we accept that we cannot be whole, we cannot be perfect, ourselves because we are not what you can do is be a part right by definition right part partial you can be part of something greater and even more importantly you can do your part so the rabbi arayat quotes the pasuk in yeshaya which is the the selfless the anavim the, the humble shall have increasing joy through the Lord. And therefore, what he's trying to say is, be happy by doing your part 
and not expecting yourself, trying to build up yourself, but yourself as part of, uh, as an Oved Hashem, as part of a greater success, doing your part is the best that you can do. And what does it mean when he says, you know, those who achieve joy is those who have, those who have, they are selfless. Selfless doesn't mean that you're worthless. Self, you have a self, just less. We're going to see that actually, if you have less of a self, you actually gain more. The point is not to build oneself up for your own sake, but to realize that you are part of the greater self. The greater self, of course, is Hashem who gave us all of our bounty. Because we can't nullify ourselves. We can't say that we're, we're selfless because God wants our service. He wants our efforts, our works, our product. Our, our, our korban gives him reach nichoach. We give Hashem nachas. So if, us, if we can give Hashem nachas, that means that what I do is important. We're not nothing. Rather, what we have to be focusing on is each and every little part. You know, Rabbi Tarfon said, the day is short, the task is great, the laborers are lazy. I'm quoting from Pirkei Avot, the reward is much. And the master insistence, he used to say, it is not for you to complete the task, but neither are you free to stand aside from it. The famous, Lo alecham l'chaligmor, v'lo ata ben chorim, l'hibatel mimena. I don't know if you've heard this story about the, uh, the star thrower. I think it was, um, I, I saw it quoted in the name of Lauren Isley. But I think it's an older legend. I don't think she made it up. But the story is told about this old man who's walking on the beach. And he noticed there's this young man who's uh, picking up starfish. They were stranded by the, uh, by the waters because the tide was going back, and now these strand starfish were all stuck. And he was throwing them back into the sea, going down the beach, one by one. He went up to him, and he asked him, why are you doing this? The young man said, that if I don't put the starfish back, they're going to die. They're going to be left exposed to the sun, and uh, they're going to dry out. They're, they're supposed to be in the water. And the, the man asked him, the beach goes on, for miles and miles. There's thousands of starfish. Well, you, you're you not going to be able to, to throw them all back. What is your little effort going to make a difference? And the young man looked at the starfish in his hand, and he threw it back into the water, and he responded to this fish, it makes a difference because every little bit that you do makes a tremendous difference. The point is not for you to be somebody. And of course you should be successful whatever you're doing, but not to be because you're going to achieve that status. You are doing your part. You're on Hashem's team. Whatever level you you are, you're working at. You know, I just saw a blessed memory of Isaac just passed away. We just had a shloshim, and I saw a beautiful clip where he describes a beautiful metaphor where, you know, it says that the, the Torah has 600,000 letters in it. Not necessarily uh, true the way we count today, but the point is, it, is it, it, it's because there are 600,000 Jews. It's an uh, archetypical number of the number of Jewish of Jews in the world, 600,000. And basically that says that each and every Jew is like a letter in a Sefer Torah. Now, just one letter by itself is meaningless, to tell you the truth. Okay, one letter, yeah, it's just a, it's just a, it's, it's a, a symbol. And it's almost meaningless unless you've got a string of words, a string of letters that make up a word. And then you string some words together and you make a sentence and you string a few sentences together, you already have an argument. And ultimately, our significance as a letter in a Sefer Torah means that we are part of something 
greater our efforts of, and you know, if the Sefer Torah is missing one letter, the entire Sefer Torah is puzzle. It's invalid. And so each and every one of us is important. We're important as members of the team, right? The famous Pirkevot, Hillel would say, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? But if I'm only for myself, what am I? So seeing ourselves, not as ourselves, but as part of a greater self, the Jewish people, part of Hashem's team, as I said before, really, I think, is the key. And that's why all these self-help books don't work. Because they're in the wrong section. Because if you're focusing on yourself, you're never going to reach happiness. Because it's impossible to build yourself up and to be complete, to be whole. The We are not designed that way. God doesn't make us perfect. Only he's perfect. And so if you want to have a successful book on happiness, it shouldn't be in the self-help section. It should be in the service section, perhaps in the religious section of the, of the, of the bookstore. And the idea is if you to achieve happiness, you perceive, recognize that you have to not be by yourself independently Mr. Perfect or Mr. Successful. You don't have to Develop yourself. Yes, develop yourself in service of a greater project. You have to be a part, be a part of that success by doing your part. And each and every Jew has his part. He has his letter to write in the Sefer Torah. I think that's really the, the key. A lot of people get, get lost in that. And they feel that they, also in Judaism, you know, you're trying to do everything perfect. It's impossible. There's no, there's no uh, shleimut. All of us humans do, do make mistakes. We do things, you know, we're not robots. And it's impossible to, to have everything perfect. But it's the process of being in relationship with Hashem and trying to... Uh, help uh, create his his uh, presence in this world that doing your part in that that's the way you can be happy because you recognize that you are part of something greater and that you are doing um, doing what you're supposed to do they say that uh, that the letters of Ratzon Hashem you're supposed to do God's will that's the same letters as Tsinor Tsinor is a pipeline, a pipe, some kind of a hose. You, so I love that that mashal because it says that you're not the, the, the wellspring of, of goodness, of, of water, of influence in the world. You have to act as a hose taking from that water source, which you all know, Maim Chaim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself, is the source of all of life in the world. Your job is to be that hose to, uh, not the spring, but the channel for the divine influence into the world. You're going to point your hose toward water the flowers and to the trees so that they can grow and, and be beautiful and give off fruit. And it's up to you to take your hose and to twist it and turn it in the right direction, point it in the right direction. Or... Similarly, if we take that same idea, your job, your part in this system of, of bringing joy to the world, of bringing God's bounty into the world, you're like, you know those water wheels where uh, there's, there's different pails that are connected up to, to a wheel and the, the wheel turns through the, uh, it's almost the mad, like magic. The wheel turns because the river is flowing through it. And each time the river flows through, it fills up the bucket. And the bucket uh, pushes the wheel forward. And each and there's, you know, maybe 20 buckets on the wheel. And each, we, each bucket gets filled up a little bit. And then it goes around to a certain point, And then it empties. It empties usually. Um, it can be devised such that it empties into a channel maybe. So it can go and, and water 
the field and irrigate a field. So each bucket though is only half full. You most of the but usually the buckets sometimes they're quarter full. Sometimes they're they're uh, you know it depends on the the tide in the river or the you know the the uh, the time of day. And so each bucket it's really the point is not so much whether the bucket is full. If you're going to be focused, if you're a bucket in that water wheel and you're saying oh I want to be full, I want to be perfect, I want you're not always going to be be full. Sometimes you know it's not up to you. But that that bucket is part of a, of a process. It's part of a, a mission. You're on the team. And there's so much joy to be on the, aren't you happy when, you're, when your sports team wins the, uh, the game? You didn't play on the, you're part of the team. You're part of the effort. You're a fan, or if you're, especially if you're, even if you're on the team, if you, you sit on the bench, you're still part of the effort of having the team be successful. So, and each, each little bit that you get the water gets transferred, even briefly. And in some cases, that water wheel actually, that motion makes, uh, creates electricity. So you can do so much by being part of this, being being part, being part, not not full, but being part of this effort. And so that's really the key that I think that Rabbi the Rayats was trying to tell us. Then the selfless shall have increasing joy if you stop trying to be full of yourself, uh, literally, be full of your self, the selfless, the anavim, the people that are humble, have greater joy than those who are full of themselves. And um, essentially what I'm saying here is that the, the key to, to joy is to get out of the self-help section, <laughs> get out of the, the you want to have joy, um, appreciate well as we started off with Rev Cook first of all you can always appreciate the good things that you're having in life and in a deeper level recognize that the, the, the bad parts of life is part of a greater perspective that Hashem uh, Hashem is, is running the world that has some sadness in it and it has some joy in it but if you recognize that it's all from Hashem that's the greater perspective now we're adding the third piece which is you know, I think so critical that you're going to have joy if you're not a perfectionist. You're going to have joy if you're not looking to to be somebody, to to be that self. You're not full of yourself, but rather you are to to be a part of the greater effort and to do your part. That's where you're going to find your joy when you're focusing. On, and it's very much focusing on what you're doing right now, not on what you did in the past, what you're planning to do in the future, and you're planning to be what you're what you're striving to be in the future. But what am I doing today if for my avodat Hashem? This time around on the water wheel, this time your pail is going to be half full. You know, sometimes those pails they even have a hole in the bottom because you know if they don't have a hole in the bottom, the the it won't work. So they're designed to be half empty and half full, which is something that uh, I think is very powerful. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to uh, be full or, or, or you know, be, um, be full of yourself or to try to fill up your bucket. You have to try to do your part. Do your part. Do your avoda every day. Do what the best you can do. And... Uh, you don't always succeed, but ultimately, if everybody's doing the 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 what they what they can do, doing their part, then that water wheel works. The motion happens, the electricity gets created, and that is a tremendously joyful exercise. Uh, one more point that I'd like to add before we uh, we close, and that is the last part of the pasuk v'yasfu. If you're interested in the Pasuk, uh, I say I quoted it before. It's from Yeshayahu 29, verse 19. simcha. The selfless shall have increasing joy through the Lord. So let's talk for a moment about this more religious part. There's an element here of um, that you're part of something. What are you part of? If you're looking outside of yourself. Who are you looking to? Bahashem, Simcha. Right? We have a pasuk that we quote: Yismach Yisrael, 
Be'osav. Israel's joy is in his creator. Yismach le'ev mevakshe Hashem. When your heart is going to be joyous, when you're searching out for Hashem. And so the key, the, the, the last point that I want to stress for you, and this is uh, an additional piece that maybe we have to train ourselves to be consciously connected to Hashem more than we, we are sometimes. It's, it's uh, an element that, that sometimes is called dvekut. But we said that the Maharal said, uh, you know, happiness is connected to perfection. But we're not perfect. Ah, but he is. And if we can recognize that we somehow are in relationship with him at all times, then we can be happy at all times. Recognize that Hashem was with me. Um, you know, we're called the children of Hashem. We talked before about being on the team, right? So we're on, we're on the winning team. Um, if you happen to be uh, born into a very rich family, so you, you're very happy because, ah, oh, I won the lottery. How happy we should be because we received this inheritance. That is so, uh, that is so special. That is so, we're so lucky. Um, so the, this, um, this is a tremendous piece of wrecking, uh, an additional piece that we're saying that it's, it's, it's not only about seeing yourself with humility and, and not being full of yourself, but being part of something greater. What is that great ultimately? That relationship that can give you joy is being together with Hashem. And Hashem, uh, like Moshe said, that when he was uh, sent to Pharaoh, he said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and free the Israelites from Egypt. And Hashem said to him, I will be with you. So I will be with you. And so Hashem is with us in this project, in this, uh, this, this life that he gave us, this task, this mission that we all are taking part of. Where it's part of Hashem's mission. And if you can cultivate this awareness uh, and, uh, you know, like I said before, uh, we think of CBT, the behavioral and the cognitive. So cognitive, like I'm saying, re recognize that we are beloved uh, sons and daughters of Hashem. And uh, the, the behavioral part, of course, is to do mitzvot. You're doing mitzvot. Uh, we, we say at, at every brit milah, I'm so happy to have the mitzvot to do. And yeah, every night in Hanukkah, we get to light one more candle. Asher kitshanu mitzvotav, we say in the bracha. Asher is ashreinu. How happy we are that Hashem sanctified us by giving us his commandments. And, um, and it can sometimes get repetitive to keep doing the same mitzvot over and over again. I saw a beautiful uh, mashal where someone said... Um, I think is the, uh, I saw it quoted in the name of Likute Torah on Bamidbar 18. And he says, when you have, uh, I don't know if you guys listen to your music, we said before on your devices, you're going to be listening to music to try to be joyful. Maybe you have Spotify. So you have uh, sometimes songs that are on repeat. You just love those songs so much. So you, you listen to them over and over again. But you heard it once. Now you enjoy it. So you do it over and over again. The mitzvot, the tefillot that we say there's a lot of repetition in Jewish life. And that is something that is, uh, if you love it, something that you're happy with, can bring you tremendous joy. Um, so that can inculcate our relationship. It, it could train us to be aware that we are living our lives in connection to Hashem, to the perfect, to something that's greater, something that's whole. And in that way, we can have joy by being connected and being a part of that greater whole. So to recap, we talked a little bit about happiness today because uh, maybe Hanukkah is the time where light, light in the darkness, joy despite that we have difficult times. And the first point we made was that you have to work at it. It's not, it doesn't come easily sometimes. Um, then we spoke about that maybe uh, the first approach would be to focus on the, so we have so much goodness in our life. Even one focus on one Nikudatova, Rabbi Nachman suggested.
find one good thing about your life or about yourself that you could be happy about. And from there, that's a, a jumping out point. Then we talked about cultivating a wider perspective of emunah, that all is part of Hashem's plans, the ups, the downs, the difficulties, the sorrow, two parts of our heart, the joyful part, and the sa- a sad part. And uh, finally, we went and talked about not how to have a perspective of, of Hashem's plan for the world, but have perspective of how to see oneself. Oneself, in essence, as an important pipeline or hose for bringing Hashem's blessings to the world. And if we focus on doing our part in that, uh, in that effort, in that team effort, writing our letter right next to the other 600,000 letters. Together we can make words, sentences, meaning, bring meaning, uh, bring the Torah, the light of Torah to this world. And I think that's the key to having joy. And I wish upon myself and I bless uh, you as well that uh, whoever is with us, that do we have joy today on this uh, festival of light and um, time of uh, joy, the mitzvah, the, the holiday of joy in the darkness. In parallel to the eight days of Sukkot, we have the eight days on Hanukkah. And from this, this, of course, should give us joy to lighten up our entire winter, all the dark times in our lives. And um, Bezrat Hashem, we should uh, just have more and more increasing joy for the rest of our lives. Hope... Um, Hope you enjoyed and enjoyed and continue to uh, be able to uh, cultivate this tremendous uh, mitzvah, mida of joy, which is so fundamental in our Avodat Hashem. Chanukah Sameach. Chanukah Sameach. Kol Tov. Chanukah Sameach. Thank you. Chanukah Sameach. Yeah, there's questions. There's time for questions. If somebody would like to uh, to uh, add or um, ask, I'm happy to, to respond. The the floor is open for anybody who wants to uh, ask anything. I, I got questions myself, but I don't want to cut in front of anybody if anybody's got one. Why don't you start us off, uh, Achihud? So um, you, you were talking about Hasidus. And um, it's kind of, it's kind of like a two part question. Um, why was the Vilna Gaon so against Hasidus? And do you think that if he were be alive today, that he would approve of it? And do you think that Hasidus, because uh, do, do you consider yourself Hasidic? Because you, you talk about it quite a bit, but I don't see you running around in a fancy bathrobe and a first spaceship on your head. <laughs> so, like, do do uh, like, do you think that people that say that they practice this uh, this uh, type of uh, yeah religious practice, um, do you think That's they've lost question. thought of the correct way? Do you think they're doing it incorrectly? So I think that, uh, I think the answer to both your parts of your question, I'll answer them together. Perhaps I'll, uh, um, I'd like to believe that a lot of the, uh, the Vilma Gon's um, opposition, he's known as a mitnaged, the, uh, the opponent of Hasidut, a lot of his opposition was, had to do with the, uh, the social structure, which Hasidut was, was uh, changing in the Jewish communal structure. And um, he felt that that was a, a dangerous thing. And today, I believe that uh, his protests have already done their job. And um, most of the Hasidic world um, has taken to heart a lot of his opposition in terms of, you know, breaking down the, the, the timing of the day. And the, the, the uh, you know, he was worried that maybe the Talmidi Chachamim and the the attitude towards Torah study would be less. Of course, we all know that the, the Hasidim today study Torah just like everybody else does in with, with Luenu and Yeshivas, maybe with a little bit of a different emphasis. But what I like to, you know, when I quote Hasidus, and you're right, I don't dress like a Hasid, that's also a social structure. In other words, um, the ideas that 
Hasidut brought to the world in terms of appreciating how to live our lives, how to be a servant of God, how to worship Hashem. Uh, I connect to some of those ideas very strongly, even though I don't put, place myself in the social circle where, you know, uh, you know, uh, you say Hasidus, today people think that you're going to be, uh, you know, having long payas and wearing a, a black hat or a fur hat of this kind or of that kind. And so I do separate between the, the, the social uh, societies, which most people uh, connect to uh, when you say the word Hasidus, and I more connect to the ideas and the, the attitude and the approach to Avodat Hashem, which I find tremendous insights in their Hasidic writings and in their Hasidic teachings, and not necessarily uh, in the Hasidic communities, which uh, I, for many other reasons, I choose not to become part of that social structure. Hope that answers the question. Um, that's enough for today. In any case, it's not really a sheer on Hasidus, but by all means, I think uh, I, it enriches my understanding of Torah to learn from the Hasidic masters and their teachings, even though, um, as, as uh, I think it's obvious, I don't, I don't um, see myself as a member of the Hasidic community necessarily, but uh, I def definitely appreciate the Hasidic teachings. And I also appreciate the Vilma Gaon's teachings, and I uh, appreciate the Sephardic teachings, and I, I try to take the best from, from all worlds. And Rav Kook, of course, as I mentioned, um, I'm proud to be a student of uh, his uh, uh, tremendous Torah leadership in this, in this uh, day and age. Um, so uh, I think that's mo more important than, uh, you know, what color uh, jacket you wear. Any other questions? You always give a, a very good answer. Thank and, you. Uh, that answer was an excellent answer. I enjoyed that answer. Amazing. It was a sincere one. Uh, well, great. I'm glad to, to share. And I, I'm um, happy to learn Torah with you. I think that's what the holiday of Hanukkah is all about, trying to bring the, the light of Torah into our lives and into our homes. And here we are in somewhat in our homes or everybody's in their place. We were on Zoom. Um, we're not, uh, we don't even have to leave our homes. So we're bringing the Torah into our homes. It's a great way, uh, most appropriate thing to do on Hanukkah. So Hanukkah Sameach. Hanukkah Thanks for having me here. Hanukkah Sameach.